And if you guys are all interested in having an autographed book or having the opportunity to have an autographed book, um, you can come up here and put your name into a drawing at some point during the night. We're happy to have Dr. Bill Long with us today. He's a professor of law at Willamette University. And he's also spoke at the University of Oregon before regarding the death penalty. He's the author of A Tortured History, the book that you have the chance to win over there in autographed number. So please help me welcome Dr. Bill Long. Thank you, Audrey, and it's good to be back here at the University of Oregon. Uh, this will work. I'll just take a few minutes to set the context for the film you're going to see, and then, because you came here for the movie tonight, but I wanted to set the context for it a little bit, and I'm happy to be at the University of Oregon. I uh, am a frequent visitor here because both of my kids have gone here, one of whom is a student here now, and so uh, I love coming down here whenever I can, especially if it's mid-January and sunny. So to put those two together at the same time is wonderful. What I'd like to do uh, is to introduce this really interesting movie. It's a 1995 movie, so in a sense it's dated, but in a sense it's also a very relevant and modern movie. Um, uh, Tim Robbins was the director, Susan Sarandon won Best Actress, uh, and it's uh, based on the story of Sister Helen Perjan, who will be here at the U of O next week at the law school and elsewhere. Uh, it represents her experience working with a few death row inmates in Louisiana in the 80s. She really worked with two inmates, but they're conflated to one person in the movie because of the difficulty of trying to do two. And there's one historical inaccuracy in the movie, which I want to mention now, and it's not because they didn't know it, it's because they wanted to do it this way. And that was that, that uh, Louisiana has changed its mode of execution um, since the time that the men w uh, whom she worked with were executed. It used to be um, electrocution, but now it is lethal injection. And so he will be going to his death in lethal injection in the movie, but that was not a statutory alternative in Louisiana at the time. But they did that because nobody knows about that other than you now. But in any case, it was to, in a sense, remove some of the issue of uh, maybe the horror of electrocution and just sort of focus on the issue itself rather than on the mode of execution. What I'd like to do in just a few minutes is to put the death penalty in context for you in America in the last few years. You can't read a newspaper today without seeing something about the death penalty. And that's really unusual for somebody who's been around for many years. The death penalty has become a front burner issue in the last five or ten years in America. And what I'd like to do in a few minutes is to tell you why. Why it is that a back burner issue has become a front burner issue. And I only want to mention three facts to you. The first back to 1972, which is long time ago, but in 1972, the United States Supreme Court voted five to four and concluded that the death penalty violated the Eighth Amendment uh, of the United States Constitution against cruel and unusual punishment. So in 1972, five to four, the death penalty was no longer constitutional, was no longer lawful. The Supreme Court didn't say it can't, be law, uh, it can't be lawful, they just said the way it is practiced in America was not lawful. The two major complaints that the majority justices had in 1972 was that it was discriminatorily applied and that it was whimsically applied. That is, there seemed to be no connection necessarily between a crime and the punishment so that a person who did something in one jurisdiction would get the death penalty in another one, they might only get a few years in prison. The Supreme Court said, if you're going to have a death penalty, come on back to us and do it in such a way that there is not this freakishness in its application. After 1972, 35, four, 38 states came back and passed a death penalty um, law in them. And there were two varieties of death penalty law that came about. And I just want to mention those very briefly to you. All of them agreed that in order to limit the discretion of the juries, we ought to have what's called a twofold or a bifurcated process. First, you determine guilt 
of a defendant and then you determine penalty or sentence. It's in the penalty phase that a jury can vote whether to send to death or not. All the states that came back, 38 states, said that they wanted to do this twofold process. But the states differed 36 to 2 on how you determined whether a person should actually go to his death. And I say his in this case as those who heard me earlier because more than 98% of those executed uh, are men. But the two ways to do it are first uh, to, to weigh factors they call aggravating or mitigating factors. In other words, in the period in which the, the jury would be deliberating, should we put this guy to death, they would weigh aggravating versus mitigating factors. It's aggravating if it's particularly a heinous crime. It's mitigating if perhaps you had a, abuse in your background. It's aggravating if you had multiple murders. It's mitigating if you have severe mental health problems, something like that. Almost every state decided to do a, um, a weighing or a balancing test. The only one that didn't was Texas. Now, Texas is the one that executes the most people in America, and they decided instead of doing a balancing, they would just do what's called a three-question test. And if the jury checked yes to all of these three questions, the person would be sentenced to death. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail of the questions, but there was only one other state that followed Texas's lead, and that was Oregon. So that when Oregon, and people don't know this, passed its death penalty law first in 1978 and then reaffirmed it in 1984 by vote of the people, we were following Texas's lead in the way we framed our statute. That can be arcane legal jargon, and we can talk about that if you want to later. But I just wanted to mention the first point is that the Supreme Court got rid of it in 72, and then it came back in the late 70s with this what's called a bifurcated process. Second point I want to mention is the 1980s. The 1980s saw dramatic social changes in American life, and especially in the criminal justice system. The 1980s saw the birth of what we now know as the crime victims movement, or the victims movement. Uh, and we think nothing of it today that loved ones should be able to speak at the penalty phase of their, uh, you know, of the defendant who murdered their loved one about the effect that the crime has had on them and have that be a factor in the jury deliberations. The victims' rights movement started in the early 80s, picked up steam, formed Crime Victims United in Oregon in 83 and became, in my mind, the single most important entity uh, shaping our understanding of criminal justice in the 80s and 90s. Right? The point was, is that victims matter. And the way this came to a head was in our political campaigns. If you were running for office, you could either be tough on crime or tougher on crime. You understand where I'm going? That was the era in which you were brought up, in which you were born. America was going through a tremendous change in how we looked at criminal justice. The major manifestation of it was prison building. The 1980s saw a tremendous um, expansion in our prison capacity in this country. Those of you who study the numbers will see it. I was working with uh, one of the high up officials in the Oregon Department of Corrections in the 80s and I asked him about their strategic plan. You know, you talk the lingo of the 80s, what's your strategic plan? And he said, well, we have to enhance capacity. What's that short for? We have to enhance capacity. We have to build more prisons. And I said, well, what numbers are we talking about? Well, he says in 1982, we have 8,000 inmates. We want 13,000 by the end of the decade. OK. There's a 62% increase in inmates in seven years in Oregon. So that was the philo but that was the philosophy in America. We'll build the prisons, and if you build them, they will come, right? We'll build the prisons, and then we'll incarcerate people to fill it. And so that was the spirit of the 80s, is that we can't lock up enough people in America. There's dangerous people out there, and of course there are dangerous people. And I'm not going to downplay that, of course. But that was our spirit in America. And that's where they belonged. Uh, the exclamation point on that era was the 1995 passage of Measure 11 in Oregon, for which one would have large mandatory prison sentences for a whole variety of crimes. OK, 
Okay, so if the 70s was the era in which the Supreme Court said abolish, or at least this isn't constitutional, come back, they came back. The 80s was a time of building of prisons of the sense that we really need to focus on criminal justice as a major uh, political issue. And we need to put lots of money into that uh, system. And so we did. In 1994 was the highest recorded support for the death penalty in, in America. 80% of uh, Americans supported the death penalty. That number is considerably less now. But that spirit was very strong in the 90s. My third and last point, something is happening now. Something significant has happened in the last eight years that is eroding that support very dramatically. And what I'd like to suggest is that there have been two arguments that have been made in the last eight years, ten years. They start in academic publications that nobody reads, but what happens is that things start filtering down and then become uh, pretty soon articulated by uh, uh, politicians and others. Since about 2000, two kinds of arguments have come forward. That is, the nature of the de debate has changed. There still are the arguments about perhaps racial discrimination, uh, perhaps it's uh, the death penalty is a poor man's crime uh, or poor man's uh, penalty. But the first thing that has happened that is changing the landscape is the development, it, found, it, it was founded in 1992, but didn't catch steam until 2000, and that's called the Innocence Project. It op maybe some of you have heard of it. It operates, first of all, out of New York, but it's got representatives all over the country now. And with the modern technological ability to uh, get DNA samples and reread them, one can, in many instances, sometimes the evidence isn't good, but in many instances one can possibly exonerate people who are committed, who, who have been committed to prison. And you see a story, don't you? Every couple months there's somebody walking out of prison after being there 20 years for a crime he didn't commit. That notion of actual innocence is now floating in people's brains. Do you understand how it goes from a concept that somebody says there may be some innocent people, you show them on the news, and now people are thinking actual innocence, and if there's one penalty for which there seems to be an irreversible uh, uh, response, it's the, it's the death penalty. So that's come out. But then there's another argument that's come out, and I argued it in first in, um, in Tortured History in 2001, and I want to develop that for a moment. Uh, when I wrote the book, I was, um, I believe that the death penalty debate in America had uh, stagnated. There were those who said they were morally opposed and those who said, fry them. And, and the people didn't talk to one another. Maybe they shouted at each other. And I said to myself, this didn't seem to me the way that I wanted to frame the argument. I was a lawyer at the time, and, uh, or in private practice, and Law is all about framing arguments and learning how to be persuasive. So I started studying the Oregon death penalty, and uh, I said to myself, it looks like there's another issue that's going on here, and that is it costs so much to not just put these people uh, behind bars, but because they have 10 legal processes after conviction, up to 10 legal processes between conviction and death, and the state pays for both sides because nobody's got any money who is in that situation. And if the state is paying for both sides, that means it's sort of a double bill. And I made the argument in this book, it was I think one of the first national arguments made, uh, that the cost of putting a person to death counterintuitively is about three times as much as the cost of executing just by virtue of the fact of the number of appeals that people have and the length of time that it takes. Well, I presented that argument to friends, people I thought were friends, sorry, in 2001, and they said, no, you're crazy. Uh, the issue is a moral issue. It's not an economic issue. The death penalty is not economic. That was in 2001. What do you hear in 2010? In September 2009, the New York Times writes an editorial that says death penalty is no longer useful in American life, and the primary reason is that we've got strapped state budgets. We, it's a very poor use of resources, which is the central argument I made in my book. 
The point is, is that we've got another argument there, and people are saying, is this a good way to use sort of precious dollars and precious resources of legal people who are talented and all the rest to argue these cases? Well, here we are today. Every month there's a new headline. In 2007, New Jersey abolished the death penalty. In 2009, New Mexico did. Uh, this year or next, in many state legislatures, there will be more attempts to do that. I can tell you about Oregon later if we want to talk after the movie. But the, uh, you'll see a headline. Let me just close by giving you what the latest one is. And uh, I can give it to you, but it will take me a minute to explain it. The American Law Institute, which consists of um, mostly law professors and judges, has just dropped from their recommended um, uh, statute, they do model statutes, the death penalty. What they say is that now it is just impossible to administer fairly. And so we, the American Law Institute, on which basis everybody built their statutes in the 70s, is now saying that the death penalty is unworkable. Well, those are the academic arguments in a way. What you're going to see now is a much more personal narrative. Because really, when you get down to it, the death penalty isn't just simply facts and numbers and lawyers arguing. It's people's lives who have been torn apart. And you'll see uh, this movie will be told from a perspective of faith, because she's a sister, and so she brings that to bear. But you see some of what you might call the moral ambiguity uh, of both uh, of the death penalty, of dealing with victims, of dealing with the defendants. So in that, I think I've said enough. And that'll give you a context to understand it. And perhaps afterwards we can, uh, if you have any questions, we can discuss. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.